Joshua chapter 24. So if you could open up your phones, open up your Bibles to Joshua chapter 24. And we'll be reading the chapter in its entirety. Joshua chapter 24. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago your forefathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the river and worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the river and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I assigned the hill country of Seir to Esau, but Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did there, and I brought you out. When I brought your fathers out of Egypt, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued them with chariots and horsemen as far as the Red Sea. But they cried to the Lord for help, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea over them and covered them. You saw with your own eyes what I did to the Egyptians. Then you lived in the desert for a long time. I brought you to the land of the Amorites, who lived east of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them from before you, and you took possession of their land. When Balak, son of Zippah, the king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent for Balaam, son of Beor, to put a curse on you. But I would not listen to Balaam. So he blessed you again and again, and I delivered you out of his hand. Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did also the Amorites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hittites, Girgashites, Hivites, and Jebusites. But I gave them into your hands. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you, also the two Amorite kings. You did not do it with your own sword and bow. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil and cities you did not build. And you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you were living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our forefathers out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, Throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, We will serve the Lord our God and obey him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people, and there at Shechem he drew up for them decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. And he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak 
near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. Then Joshua sent the people away, each to his own inheritance. After these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance at timnath Sarah, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. And Joseph's bones, which the Israelites had brought up from Egypt, were buried at Shechem in the tract of land that Jacob bought for a hundred pieces of silver from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. This became the inheritance of Joseph's descendants. And Eleazar, son of Aaron, died and was buried at Gebeah, which had been allotted to his son Phinehas in the hill country of Ephraim. This is the word of the Lord. Well, there's a lot to cover in this passage tonight, so let's seek God's help as we go through it. Our great God, we thank you for the privilege now to consider your word. We thank you that you have given us your word, and we thank you for the joy it gives us. We thank you for the conviction that it brings as well, and we pray that it would be doing these things right now. God, we pray that you would humble us, help us to accept accept what you say, Help us to not fight against the things that your word says, uh, but may we trust you and trust your wisdom. And we pray for your help now to apply all that we learn. Amen. Often at key points in our lives, we tend to reflect and look back and make new commitments. And this is what is happening here in Joshua. They're committing to serve God and to follow his ways and have faith in his work in their lives. Will you do that tonight? Will you commit to serving God? Will you commit to worshipping Him again with all that you are? Do you want this to happen? Do you want to deepen in how you serve God and worship Him? If you do, then Joshua 24 is here to help us and show us how. And I think we are in a season at the moment where we really need to commit to serving God. We today need to completely commit to serving God because we're in a difficult season ahead. Turmoil surrounds us. Hardships await Christians as some states begin to ban prayer and our ability to call homosexuals to repentance. As even Bible colleges in this very city begin to graduate homosexuals. As schools in our area begin to not uh, begin to start uh, saying in school reports rather than saying he or she for some students disregarding that because of them disregarding God's call on what, how he's made that student. As year one curriculums teach that families can have two dads or two mums, as churches uh, include in their registration form the gender category of other, and we could go on and on. We are in a time today where we need people who will commit to serving God, commit to following his ways. Castle Hill Baptist, we as a church at this time need to commit to God and his ways and to serving Him, because it's going to get hard. So many are turning from Him, and there's danger that some of you may as well. There's, there's a danger that some of you may just slip into tolerance, as so many are, slip into ease, slip into comfort, and not stand up for the truth and follow God's ways. So our passage today, it calls us again to commit to God, to commit to serving Him, and I hope and pray that by the end of today, we will be able to say what Joshua does. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Or what the Israelites say, we will serve the Lord because He is our God. Or we will serve the Lord and obey Him. I hope by the end we too can say that. That's what I want for myself. It's what I want for my family. And that's what I want for you guys as well. This is what matters. Everything in this life, it's going to come to an end. But how we serve the Lord and whether we serve the Lord, that's the one thing that will endure. So this is what matters, and we need to think about this and learn how to serve the Lord. Now we, if you know, you've been with us, this is our 
uh, last chapter now in Joshua. We've been going through all the book of Joshua. We come to our last chapter. This is the last sermon on the book of Joshua. So let's just quickly give a a brief overview of what has happened, and I I will be very brief. The book of Joshua has been showing us the, the people of Israel entering the promised land. It's shown how they have taken that land, they've divided that land, and now they've gone in and received it as their inheritance. And then in chapter three, uh, chapter 23, Joshua has addressed Israel. He's told them their need to obey God again, to be careful to love Him. He's given a warning as well. If they disobey Him, how they will perish, and God's anger is going to burn against them. And then we get to chapter 24. And chapter 24, verse 1, says this. Have a look. Joshua 24, verse 1. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem, He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. So here they all come before God. This is something that's happening before God. It's very important. And Joshua's giving them a charge now. And the aim of this charge is to see these people commit to serving God, commit to worshipping Him. The the, the word there for serving can also be translated worshipping. So he's wanting them to commit to serving or worshipping God. And that's, that's the aim of this sermon. That's what I want to see happen in us as well. So the, the big question we're going to cover is, what will help us to commit to serving God? What will help us to completely serve God? Well, the first thing we see in the passage in verse 2 to 13 is that we need to consider God's gracious work. We need to consider God's gracious work in our lives. We can't go through it in too much depth. There's a lot here. But you see in verse 2 to 13, Joshua tells Israel their past. He summarizes their past for them. He tells them all that God has done in bringing them redemption, in bringing them victory. You see it there. Verse 2 to 4 talks about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and God's provision for them. Verse 5 speaks of the plagues in Egypt, how God delivered the Israelites out of Egypt. Verse 6 to 7 talk about the parting of the, the sea and then how the Egyptians are killed in the sea. Verse 8, verse 11 to 13, they talk about the victory God's given them in conquering the land. And then as well, verse 9 and 10, you see as well how God did not allow Balaam to speak curses on the people of Israelites, but God was committed to his people and Balaam could only bless them. So we see a bit of an overview of Israel's history here. And the big point is to show that God has done all this work for them. God has been working you see it again and again. It, can you see through those verses? Have a, have a skim through. You'll see how it says, I did this. God's, God's speaking. You say, I did this. I did that. I gave this. I sent that. God is showing how he has been working. And just for one example, verse 12 to 13, have a look there. It makes it really clear of this point. It says in verse 12 to 13, I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you, also the two Amorite kings. You did not do it with your own sword and bow, So I gave you a land on which you did not toil and cities you did not build. And you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. You can see the point God is trying to show. He's the one who's done this work. He's done the saving work. He's provided the victory for them. He's the one who has been doing this work. Not them. It's been God. And yet, the Israelites, they still had to fight the battles. They still had to work in dividing the land. They were still involved in this. Just because God was going ahead and going to deliver, it didn't mean they didn't have to fight, did it? No, we saw them. We saw the battles. And we're going to see as well, God calling them to choose to serve Him. Just because God has chosen them and worked in them, it doesn't mean that they don't have to serve Him and follow Him. And it's always like this in the Bible. God has worked, but it doesn't mean we sit back. It does not mean we sit back. These two things always run in parallel. This is how it is with our salvation. It's not our work that matters and counts before God to be saved. It's God's work. He's shown mercy on us. He's shown grace in our lives. He's caused us to be born again so that we are able to have faith in Him, so that we are able to repent as Ian prayed, so that we're able to turn from our sin. But though it's God's work in us, and He's done this work in us, we do not sit back, do we? We are not to sit back. The Bible commands us to believe in Christ. The Bible commands us to seek the Lord while He may be found, to forsake sin, to repent, and to turn to Christ. The Bible puts this call on us as well. And when we do those things, 
we can know that God has been working in us to bring that about by His Spirit. He's done that. This is the only way that salvation is possible. This is the only way salvation is possible for us who are dead in sins, the Bible says, for us who cannot please God, says Romans, who cannot seek God, who cannot submit to God's law. This is the only way for us to be saved, for God to work in us. We can't bring ourselves to that point of being saved. We know that. But if you are saved, and if you have believed, you can know that God has done that work in you. And He has brought you to that point where you have faith in the finished work of Christ. It's only by God's grace that we have these things. Only by the free gift that He gives us. The the only way you are redeemed, the only way that you are saved, the only way that you have this hope of eternal salvation with God and eternity with Him is by His gift is by Him giving these things to you, by His free grace. That's why it's amazing grace. That's why we call it this, and that's why we sing about it. So we are saved because God graciously works in our lives. And this is the point we see here in verse 12 to 13, that God wants to show the Israelites again. He wants to show them their work, His work in their lives. And the point here is to show them that this is necessary to enable service to God. To enable us to commit to serving God, we must consider God's gracious work in our lives. That's what Israel's being reminded of here in verse 2 to 13. And we need to be reminded of that as well, to be enabled to serve God. When you remember the gift of the freedom you have in Christ, that you have no condemnation, that you have forgiveness in Christ, the only right response to that is worship, is serving God. And so to ready us to fully serve God and to properly serve Him, we need to again encounter the depths of what we have in Christ and the depths of God's work and what He's done in our lives. That is going to ready us to serve God. So what will help us serve God? Well, the first point we see there in in verse 2 to 13 is we need to consider God's gracious work in our lives again. That will help us serve God. Secondly, in verse 14 to 18, Joshua 24 what will help us serve God? What will help you to serve God? Well, you need to completely devote yourself to the Lord. Here in these verses, Joshua commands for complete and full service to God. Look at verse 14. Verse 14 says this, Now fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. Throw away the, the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. God is to be served with all faithfulness. Just as God has been faithful to them, they are to be faithful to Him. And they are to throw away their gods. They are to throw away all other gods and they are to worship God alone, the one true God. And here's a call for complete devotion. But why? Why are they to completely devote themselves to God? Well, we've seen it already because of what we saw in verse 2 to 13, because of the work that God has done in their lives. That's why. God's devotion to us should motivate us to have devotion to Him. God's commitment to us should cause us to be committed to Him. God's service and work in our lives should cause us to serve Him. And if it doesn't, and if it isn't, If this isn't what is motivating service in you, then it will not be genuine, it will not last, and it won't truly worship God. But maybe, for some of you, you're not even thinking like that. Maybe some of you here are thinking, I don't even really want to serve God. Maybe you're thinking like that. You say you're a Christian, but you don't really want to be devoted to Him. You don't really want to serve Him. Maybe that's how you feel. Well, if that's you, verse 15 is for you. Verse 15 says... But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in the land you are living. Does worshipping God seem undesirable to you? Is it something you just don't really want to do? Don't fool yourself. Some of you here might feel like that and might be like that. You don't really want to serve God. You don't really want to devote yourself to Him. You don't really want to follow His ways. Don't fool yourself and deceive yourself. If this is you, you need to choose today. Who will you serve? Whom will you serve? And you need to realize who you're serving and not fool yourself. Don't claim that you worship God or don't claim that you are seeking God or that you are a Christian 
when it's actually undesirable for you to even serve him and be devoted to him. You need to choose today whom you will serve. You're going to serve somebody or something. Who is it going to be? Who is it going to be? Jesus says this. He says in Matthew, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. It's impossible, guys, to serve God and something else. It's impossible. God demands complete devotion to Him. A complete devotion to Him. And yet, so many of us, and us at times, we think we can just tack God onto our lives, just slip Him in a little bit, and just let Him have a little part of our lives, and we think that's enough. Some of you guys might think this. And I love you, and I, I want to say, if, that, if that's you, if you think that, then you're actually not serving God. That is not serving God. If you think you can just tag him on and just make that little claim, yeah, I'm a Christian, but you're not devoted to him. You're not serving God. God demands devotion to him. Either he, he's everything to us. He's either everything in our life or he isn't anything to us. We're either committed to him and devoted to God or we do not serve him and we despise him. That's what Jesus said. Not me, that's what Jesus says. And Joshua knows this as well. That's why he's saying, choose this day whom you will serve, because you can't serve both. That's the point. So choose this day whom you will serve. And I pray for us, I hope that we will choose this day to be like Joshua, to serve the Lord. To serve the Lord. That we would say like he does in verse 15 again, as for me and my house, we will serve God the Lord. That's Joshua's focus. That's his commitment. That's what he devotes himself to, the Lord alone. That's devotion. That's devotion. And and we could notice, we can notice a lot about his leadership here and how he's leading his family in this. We're going to get back to that at the end, but we'll we'll move on for now. We then go to verse 16 and 18, and and here we, we don't want to spend much time because the people really sum up again what we've seen in verse 12 Uh, verse 2 to 13, and they're just restating some of the things we saw there of how God has worked in their lives, of how God has been doing all these things. And you see it repeated again in verse 16 to 18. And then they say, at the end, in response, this is in response to Joshua's call, whom will you serve? Well, they say at the end of verse 18, we too will serve the Lord because He is our God. They have to serve the Lord. They want to serve the Lord because He is He's their God, our God. They've seen what what God has been doing for them. That's why they're calling Him our God. He's been working for them. He's redeemed them. He's given them victory. He's their God. And so they say, we must serve Him. That's why we will serve Him, because He's been our God. And that's why we should serve Him, because He's been our God. He's redeemed us. He has saved us. He's given us victory in Christ. He's been our God. So, Won't we serve him then because of it? Will we not serve him if he's done all of that? Will we not? Do we want to? We should because of what God has done. It should cause us to have a complete devotion to him. So what will help us to commit to completely serving God? Well, the third thing we see here is that we also need to count the cost of serving God. Count the cost of serving God. We see this in verse 19 and 20 and verse 23. Joshua says in verse 19 that he says the pe- that you're going to fail. You Israelites will fail. And this has elements of truth in it, but it's not absolutely true either because verse 31 shows us that they do serve God. You have a look there, verse 31. It says they do serve God. Here we see Israel, they're committing to serve God, but Joshua's challenging their commitment. And he's questioning it before he makes a covenant with God, with them. He says they can't. And I think the point is to make them realize how serious this commitment is, to not take it lightly and to be sure they are really going to commit to serving God. And we need this challenge as well. We need this challenge as well. I think it's important and I feel responsible here at this point in the sermon to give this same challenge to us, to count the cost of committing to God. It's important we count the cost of committing to God. Verse 20 shows us that 
the result of forsaking God and turning from Him is having God turn on us and bring disaster. There's a cost if we don't serve God. But verse 19 also shows the cost if we follow Him and if we serve Him. Because it says in verse 19 and shows that God is holy. He will not take rebellion lightly. He's a jealous God too. And He's jealous for His glory. He's jealous for our good. And just as a husband or a wife is jealous for their partner if they turn from them, so God is jealous for us if we turn from Him because He knows what is best for His glory and for our good. And He's jealous for that. And He wants us to be devoted to what is truly good, to what is best for us. And that's Himself. And so there's a cost in serving God. And we see it particularly as well in verse 23. Have a look there. Verse 23, it says... Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. We've been talking about that complete devotion that God requires of us. It's a committing to serve and worship Him with our whole life, not just the bits and pieces we've been talking about. And therefore, an implication of that is throwing away idolatry. You must throw away idolatry. We can't come being devoted to God and clinging to idols at the same time. No, if we are devoted to God, we will yield our hearts to Him. We will submit and surrender to Him completely and we will throw away idols. And until we let go of idols, until we let go of the the many things that we are treasuring in our life, we will not be able to completely devote ourselves to God. We will not be able to serve the Lord. It's not possible. And how do you think God, how can a God rescue us, rescue a people who are still clinging to their sin and still loving it and holding on to idolatry? How can a God rescue people like that? No, He works in us to strip us from that. That's repentance. And so we need to let go of these things if we are to completely serve God. I think of it like this, the picture of a child sticking their hand through a fence and I've seen it happen, and it's happened to me in my own life as well. When you stick your hand through a fence to grab something, and it's quite small, so you make your hand as small as you can, and you get it through the fence, and then you grab the thing you wanted to get, and you try to pull the hand back, and you realize it's stuck. You can't get your hand back through, and you start panicking, wondering what's wrong. And hopefully, eventually, you realize, well, you can let go of that thing and get your hand back through. But as long as you're clinging to whatever it is you wanted, you will not get your hand back through. It's too big for that hole until you let go, then you can get it back. And that's what it's like for us. If we continue clinging on to other gods, if we continue clinging on to our sin, if we don't let go, we will not be able to devote ourselves to serving God. We will not be able to serve the Lord. Jesus says the same thing. He shows us this cost again and again. He says in Luke 14, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, and mother, his wife and children, his brothers, sisters, yes, even his own life. If anyone does not let go of these things, he cannot be my disciple. And he goes on to say, and anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Any one of you who does not give up, renounce, does not let go of everything he has, cannot be my disciple. There's a cost, isn't there, to serving God? And and Jesus wants us to count the cost, and I think here we're seeing Joshua wants Israel to count the cost of serving God again and committing to that, and we need to count the cost before we serve Him. We need to be willing, when we come to serve God, to completely submit our lives to Him and surrender all that we are, everything that we have to Him, and to do what He wants and to please Him. There's a cost to serving God, and that is the cost. And so Joshua emphasizes this, and, and once he's emphasized this to the people of Israel and helped them to count that cost, he then is able to help them commit again to God and make a covenant with God again. And that's what we see in this fourth point. What will help you serve God? Well, we saw that we need to count the cost of serving God. We need to consider God's gracious work in our lives And we saw as well that we need to completely devote ourselves to serving the Lord. 
Consider God's gracious work. Completely devote yourself to serving the Lord. Count the cost of serving the Lord. And the first, fourth point, what will help us serve the Lord? Commit to serving the Lord. We, it's a commitment. It's, we need to covenant to serving God and commit to it. That's what we see in verse 21 to 33 at the end here, at the end of the passage. In these verses here, Joshua is renewing the covenant again with the people of Israel. And we've been through this a little bit in Joshua already. And we see there in the verses, they, they have this memorial witness set up. It says that they are witnesses to the commitment mem- they're making. It says the commitment's being recorded in the book of the law. This commitment is trying to be set in stone and there's accountability that they're held to and there's reminders that are set up in place so that they will be reminded of their commitment. Now, should we have this? Should we have these memorials and these things to remind us of our commitment to God? Well, I think in a sense we do. Yeah, when we have baptisms, we are reminded again of someone who has been saved by God, someone who has had God work in their life and we're reminded of God's work in our lives. And the other is the Lord's Supper as well, what we've done tonight. As we do that, we are reminding ourselves again of Christ's sacrifice and our devotion to Him because of it. So I think in a sense we do have some of these memorials. But also I know for myself, and I think we should be doing this in our personal times, we should be committing again to God. Committing again to God to be used by Him, however He pleases. I find this important in my own life. To say to God, take my life, let it be consecrated to you, to thee, God. To say to God, I am yours, my life is yours to use however you want. Use it in that way, God. I find I have to do that at different points. It's not that I do it all the time, but there's times where we should commit to God in this way and recommit again and again to Him and His service. And that's what we see Israel doing here, committing again to serve the Lord and to worship Him. And as I said before, verse 31 shows that they do. You can have a look there in verse 31. They serve the Lord under Joshua, but then Joshua dies. And Eleazar the priest dies, and the other elders of Israel die, and their bones are buried, and Joseph's bones are buried. We, can't, we don't have time to dig it, all of that, but we see here that their bones are buried to really emphasize that the land has been conquered. They've received the promised land. And I think it's interesting too here we see Israel's leader, Joshua, dies. Their, their saviour, Joseph, who really saved the people of Israel, because, through the famine because of the 12 brothers, uh, the 11 other brothers who were saved and Jacob who was saved. He was really their saviour, Joseph. So Israel, their leader, dies. Their saviour, Joseph, dies. Eliezer, he's the high priest, he dies as well. And it, it leaves us longing for more because we're about to see the people don't go on serving God in future generations. So it leaves us longing for more. This isn't enough. These people are dying. But we do have more, don't we? We have Christ, our leader, who does not die, who lives forever. We have Christ as our high priest. We have Christ as our saviour. And he does not die. He rose again and conquered death. And he lives forever and he provides eternal life for us. What a hope. And I think we can see a bit of a, maybe a glimpse. Maybe maybe we're reading a little bit into it, but a bit of a glimpse to Christ and the great hope that he is for us. But I want us now to see, we, we get to the end of Joshua. The story doesn't end at Joshua, though, do, does it? We've got the rest of the Bible. Where does the story go? Well, straight into Judges. Straight into the book of Judges. This is what happens after these leaders die, and we see that the generations don't go on to follow God, do they? In Judges chapter 2, turn there, Judges chapter 2, verse 6 to 12 It carries on the story, really. It really starts picking up from verse 28 in our passage and carries on from verse 28. And it carries on the story, and you'll see some similarities between Joshua 24 and then these verses here. And we see the rest of the story. So Judges chapter 2, verse 6 to 12, it says, After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went out to take possession of the land, each to his own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. We've we've already read those things at the end of Joshua. Verse 8, it continues. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 and they buried him in the land of his inheritance at timnath Heres in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the Mount Gaash. After that whole generation had been gathered up to their fathers, another generation grew up. 
who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord. And we could keep reading, but we see the point already. We know in Judges, the people of Israel did what was right in their own eyes and they forsook God and they turned from him. Why? Why does this new generation not follow God? The generation before did. They served the Lord. It said it at the end of Joshua. It says it in Judges here now too. But this new generation doesn't. Why is this? Well, I, we can't be fully sure, but I think we get some hints through the Bible. I think we get some hints. Often in the Old Testament, we see that there's a call on the people of Israel to tell the works of God again and again to the next generation. We see it in Deuteronomy, we see it in the Psalms, we see it in other passages, this call to tell the next generation. And it seems here the next generation in Judges wasn't taught. And so they did what was right in their own eyes instead. The generation before, they had served God. But then it seems like they haven't passed this on. And I think it's interesting in in the responses back in Joshua 24, we see Joshua say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But Israel, at a few different points, they just say, we will serve the Lord. We too will serve the Lord. They never make this commitment as well to passing it on to the next generation and to committing their household as well to serving God. And it seems, I think, they, that they failed to pass it on in a right way. What should have happened? What should have they done? Well, have a listen to Psalm 78, verse 4 to 8. It tells us what should have happened. It says this. The psalmist says, We will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, His power and the wonders He has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and establish the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. They would not be like their forefathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. There's a great picture of what is supposed to happen in every generation, how every generation is to be taught, and the things of God, the works that God has done, are to be passed on to the next generation. But unfortunately, Judges shows some shocking things about Israel and where they have gone. And it doesn't seem that this has happened. And it said back there in Judges 2 that they had forgotten the works of God and what he has done. So it seems that this generation before them haven't properly passed on the teaching and the truth of God and what he's done. And therefore, part of us serving God is, yes, we need to do the things we've already seen in the passage, but part of us is not just continuing to serve the Lord in our own lives, but helping others to serve the Lord as well. We must help others to serve the Lord as well if we truly serve the Lord. This must happen. Family worship discipling and passing things on to the next generation are so important. They are so key. We need to first be a people who will worship God. It needs to happen in our personal lives. We need to worship God as a church together, but we also need to worship God in our homes. We need to worship God as we meet with others, as we disciple others. We need to together worship God in these ways too. In our ministries, we need to seek to worship God and lead the next generation to worship God. That's why we need leaders, older, mature people in our kids' ministry. That's why we want older, mature people in our youth ministry. We need the older generation to serve the Lord and to lead others to serve the Lord as well. But in particular, I think in our passage here, we're we're being called to pass on something to the next generation in a particular way, and it's through family worship. In in verse 15, we see Joshua say, we know it, it's that famous verse, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Or it could be translated, the word serve, often in the Old Testament, it's either translated serve or worship. We, We will serve the Lord or we will worship the Lord. This is probably the best known verse in Joshua. And I was talking about it with Nathan and we agreed. We need to spend some time here. It'd probably be great to do a whole sermon here. Um, But we don't have time to do a whole sermon. But I want to give us a few points here about this verse and about family worship because it is so important that we consider this. Joshua here is saying, I will worship the Lord and my family will worship the Lord. 
And he's able to say that because he's the leader over his family. And and therefore, there's a call for us who are leaders of our families, those who are husbands and fathers particularly, there's a call on you to lead your family to serve the Lord. You need to lead your family to serve the Lord. We need Christian families that are serving God and worshipping him. But it's not just for families and for husbands. If there is anyone under your care, and we all should have people under our care spiritually, if there is anyone under your care, you should be leading them to serve the Lord. Whether it's people in your ministry, whether it's someone younger than you that you're discipling, or whether it's your own children, you need to lead that generation to worship God and to serve Him. And, and some of you are doing this. And that's encouraging. And I encourage you to, to keep that up. But at the same time, we all fail in this to some degree. We all fail in this and we all need to grow in this more and more. And so I want to encourage us in this and encourage you to today, start doing this if you're not. There's, there's not a better season to start this. It's right now. Don't think if your kids are only one or two that oh, it's going to be better once they're a bit older. No, start now. It starts now. It's never too late and it starts straight away. We need to start leading others to worship God. So what should help us do this? I want to give us a few points here at the end as we come to a close. What should help us uh, in family worship, but also what should help guide us in how we disciple and in how we invest into people and in how we teach others to worship God and serve Him? What should help us? What should guide how we do it? Well, the first point, I'll just be brief. It should be about the worship of God. We, we call it family worship, and I make this point because sometimes it can just become family teaching, but it's not just teaching the next generation, or it's not just teaching the kids, it's worship. We want them to worship God. We want them to adore God. We want them to love Him and serve Him and be devoted to Him. We don't just want them to know things about God. It's family worship, and we want to lead others that are younger than us as well, not to, just to know God, but to worship Him. That's what we're aiming at. So remember that, and may that guide you. It's not just learning, but it's about worship. We want to lead people to serve Him and obey Him. Second point to help guide us, we need to be purposeful as we do it, and we also need to make it enjoyable. I think families need to remember this. It it should be a purposeful time. We need to make plans to be able to do it. We need to know what we're doing and be purposeful and have an aim in what we're doing as we're teaching. But make sure it's enjoyable. Make sure the kids enjoy it and it doesn't become a burden to them. And that might mean getting them involved, getting them to act out the passage that you might be teaching them, getting them to read a verse, getting them to pray at the end or share a prayer point that they think would be helpful to pray for or illustrating the things you're teaching to them. We need to make it enjoyable but be purposeful in what we're doing. Also, it needs to be planned. I said that already, but it also needs to be spur of the moment at times. It needs to be planned and it needs to be spur of the moment. You need to prepare, you might need to use structures or forms or resources and plan it out, but also there's spur of the moment things you need to do in family worship or as you're leading others to follow God. There might be a situation that arises and there's a passage that's relevant to that situation and you read it and it's it's just spur of the moment or something else happens and you, you need to pray about it and you pray as a family or you pray with that individual you're investing into. So be planned, but be spur of the moment. Also, It needs to be in every moment and it also needs to have set times. It's similar to the point before, but I want to make the point we need to have set times where we do this. As families, where we learn and worship God, you need those set times. Yes, worshipping God, we know, can happen in every part of our day as Christians. It can happen in all of our life. But we have a set time now where we gather to worship God and we need that as well in family life and with those we may be inputting into and trying to disciple. Fifth point, it needs to be consistent and not overburdening. I think what's very helpful in family worship and in discipling others is to be as regular as you can and be as consistent as you can. And you might only go for 10 minutes, but you try to do that every day and go for 10 minutes rather than at the end of the week go for an hour or two hours. Or with those you disciple, it's better to be regular and consistent rather than meet once every two months for three or four hours. Better to be regular and consistent and in each other's lives and therefore not be overburdening as well by doing, keeping it small and keeping it short. Uh, number six, and, and this is simple and very important though, we need to 
be sitting under God's Word as we're doing it. Family worship is about sitting under God's Word. It's about praying to Him and singing and praising Him as well. It's simple. It's really that simple. We're sitting under His Word. We're seeking Him in prayer. We're confessing sin, maybe. We're praising Him for who He is. And we're singing to Him as well. That's what family worship is. It can be simple. And and that's a big point here. Make sure it's simple. It doesn't need to be complicated. It can be simple. I know for us in our life, it's sometimes just over brekkie, I'll share something I've read in the morning already. And it's just me sharing something I've read. It's simple. Or we'll use a resource at night and a Bible story or something else that's easy and simple to use. It doesn't have to be complicated, but it can be simple. And there's many great things that can help us in that. And finally, what should help guide family worship or those we invest into, I label this point as it should be a discipling time. And what I mean by this, it needs to be this teaching time, it needs to be a correcting time, it needs to be a caring time where you're spiritually caring for these people. All of these things are involved in it. You're seeking to nurture these people that are under your care to fully follow Christ. That's what you're seeking to do. So it needs to be a a, a discipling time, I call it. Now, this is an important work, but sometimes we don't see it as an important work. So I want to give us just three reasons why this is important before I then try to tackle some of the, uh, I guess, excuses we have to this, and then I'll close. So three reasons why it's important. It's because God commands it. I think we've seen it in our passage with Joshua and how he modelled it, but we see it commanded in passages like Deuteronomy 6 and Ephesians 5 as well, where families are told to be doing this. We see as well it's important because the Proverbs show that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. We need to train that out of them. That's our role as parents, to lead them in God's ways and instruct them in God's ways and and train that out of them. Foolishness is bound up in their heart. And, And just a third reason why we need to do it, we could go through many, but it's the fact that God is great. God is worthy of worship. He deserves our worship and He deserves the worship of your family and the worship of those under your care and the worship of those you're discipling. That's why we must do it, because God is worthy of worship and He's worthy to be worshipped by this next generation that's coming up. So we need to be doing this, because He's worthy of it. Now, I want to beat down and knock down some of the objections that we have. I've just picked out three. Some of the objections we may have to this, some of the barriers we may have. The first one probably is the biggest. I'm too busy for it. I'm just too busy for it. If this is you, I I challenge you, look at your life. What's filling up your life? Have a look at it. What's filling up every moment? What are you doing? And now ask yourself when you see that, are all of these things more important than helping your family worship the Lord and leading the next generation to worship God? Are all of them more important than that? No, they're not. We know that. There's things in our life that aren't more important than that. And so I challenge you, what can you cut out of your life to make sure you're doing this? What can you cut out? What idols maybe do you need to get rid of and throw off like the Israelites did so that you can worship God first and then lead others to worship God as well? Two more objections. We might say, I don't know how to answer the questions that they come with. They're hard questions. I don't know how to answer them. I don't know how to teach. If this is you, I just want you to realize you don't have to. It, It can be simple like I've already said. You need to first grow deepen your worship of God and then just lead others in that and share what God is teaching you with them. It doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to know everything. That's not the heart of family worship. That's not at the heart of discipling, knowing everything. It's, it's leading others to follow Christ and leading them with the things that God has given you and taught you. It doesn't have to be everything. And then the third objection might be, I don't know what to do. Well, if this is you, I challenge you back with what we said before. Just be simple read God's Word, pray a little bit together and sing a song. Be simple. Maybe as well, if you struggle not knowing what to do, grab a book like this one. I know Nathan's recommended this one before, Family Worship by Joel Beakey. It's very simple and it's a good overview of family worship. Or this one here, Family Discipleship. It's by Matt Chandler and Adam Griffin. Grab a book and learn about it if you don't know what to do. But also if you don't know what to do, I challenge you to come out after the service, after we finish and wrap up. I've got about 10 or 15 books here, some of them that I've used, some of them that I've recommended to parents, 
uh, of teenagers in the church, and some of them are that are great that I use for one-on-one discipling. Come and have a look at some of the books. I'll maybe, we can sit down here and I'll show some of the books off, okay? And you can have a look through them so you can gain some resources and know what to do and they might help you. Well, as we close now, let's be a people who commit to worshipping God. We need to be like this, Castle Hill. We need to commit to worshipping God and to leading others in it. Will you do this? Will you commit to worshipping God? Will you renew your commitment to Him today and to completely serving Him? Will you completely surrender all that you have, all that you are, to serving the Lord? Or will you take the path of ease and tolerance and convenience and pleasure and idolatry instead? Will you turn from God and therefore have God turn from you and have disaster come upon you because of it. Who will you serve today? Who will you serve, Castle Hill? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, and I pray and hope that we will together do this and serve the Lord. Let's pray. Great God, we thank you for this wonderful book, for Joshua and all the things we have learnt. God, we pray that you would lead us to be a people who would serve and worship you. We have so much to grow in this area. We thank you already for the work you have done in our lives, how we are serving you in certain ways and worshiping you, but God, we need it so much more. We need your work in us to cause us to be a people devoted to you. May you challenge us, God, and convict us when we, were, when we don't want to serve you. If there are any here tonight, who really don't want to serve you, may they realize who they are serving and the state they are in. And I pray, God, that you would bring anyone here tonight who has not committed to you, who has not put their faith in Christ, may you bring them to you and may you save them. And may they speak with someone tonight about these things. And we pray, God, that everything we have considered would be honoring to you and that we would seek to do these things for your glory and for our good. Amen.